Thank you for joining us this afternoon for uh, part one of a multi-part webinar series by ATA Engineering called Leveraging System Simulation to Accelerate Development of Urban Air Mobility and Distributed Electric Aircraft. I am your host, Scott Tebow from ATA Engineering, and our speaker today is Dr. Lane Clemen, also from ATA Engineering. So I'd like to begin by introducing ATA Engineering itself as the sponsor for this afternoon's webinar. ATA Engineering is an employee-owned small business with a full-time staff of around 180. We have to keep constantly updating that number as we're probably pushing 200 or so now. Uh, and we provide high value engineering services to a wide range of industries. Uh, including the aerospace industry, the subject of today's webinar, but also robotics and controls, themed entertainment, uh, defense, indus industrial and mining equipment, et cetera. Our aim is to help our customers solve the most challenging engineering problems. We have a number of offices across the country. Our headquarters is in San Diego, California, but we also have offices in LA and the Bay Area and Denver, Albuquerque, Huntsville, Alabama, and Washington, DC. We provide services for design, analysis, and test for all kinds of uh, industrial products. So before we launch into the, uh, the webinar proper, it's necessary to give a little bit of a background as to what is SimCenter AIMSIM. To begin with, SimCenter AIMSIM is a part of the Siemens software product family, and ATA Engineering is a platinum level solutions partner for Siemens. So we provide our customers licenses and support services for AIMSIM, as well as a wide variety of other software, including uh, FEMAP, SimCenter 3D, SimCenter NASTRAN, Star CCM Plus, and many others. The AIMSIM product is a part of the SimCenter systems modeling role. It allows to model even the most complicated systems with a variety of different uh, levels of fidelity from very simple 1D models up to and including live system and loop, hardware and loop or uh, CFD calculations or other high fidelity models all within a systems approach. SimCenter AIMSIM supports the modeling of all types of aircraft, airplanes, unmanned aerial vehicles, or in this uh, case of today's webinar, urban air mobility vehicles, helicopters, rockets, satellites, spacecraft, and many others. There are about 200 aerospace companies worldwide that use SimCenter AIMSIM every day for this kind of work. AIMSIM provides a scalable, multi-physics behavioral modeling and analysis capability that covers the full range of systems that you will find in an aircraft. These include flight controls, flight dynamics, ECS or environmental controls, fuel systems, electrical systems, uh, landing systems, etc. It is uh, intended to cover a full range of systems from fluids to thermodynamics, energy controls, mechanical, propulsion, electrical, Etc. AIMSIM is a mature product that has been offered in the market for over 30 years and supports industry standard, standards such as Modelica and the functional mock-up interface and offers uh, co-simulation with other Siemens products and connection to third-party standard products as well. SimCenter AIMSIM does offer some dedicated solutions for the aerospace industry. So there are, uh, as I'll explain later, some uh, templates and models that are specific to aerospace systems. So here, for example, we're looking at scenarios. These could be flight mission profiles, uh, changes in altitude, wind direction, uh, aircraft velocity, et cetera. How does that impact things like fuel systems or battery life? Uh, battery thermal condition or uh, cabin comfort, et cetera. All aircraft systems can be modeled in AIMSIM. 
And from those models, you can derive performance as Dr. Clemen will be showing us shortly in the live demo. Here's an example of a very complicated aerospace system modeled in AIMSM. This is a liquid rocket engine. You can see the different components of the rocket engine um, and how they're put together in order to model a very complicated system. I myself have seen rocket engine charts uh, 50 times more complicated than this one. Uh, they are extremely, extremely complicated systems, and yet they can be modeled in AIMSEN. Uh, this was an original model done in 2002, and in 2007 was extended to a transient case. Landing systems, particularly hydraulics, are also easily modeled in AIMSEN, as are environmental control systems. Uh, environmental controls or cabin comfort are going to be a significant part of any urban air mobility aircraft design uh, as it's necessary to keep your passengers comfortable, but the demands of the ECS system do place demands on your battery. And so you have to manage not only the battery thermal performance, but also the, the thermal condition of the air in the cabin. That is a complicated system, but one that is well within the capabilities of AIMSEM. Here is uh, an example of a valve design for a hydromechanical servo actuator, uh, in this case, uh, clearly for a helicopter. But in the urban air mobility world, we're generally trying to avoid pneumatic and hydraulic systems in favor of electromechanical actuators and controls. And those are also handled in AIMSEM as shown here. Here are a couple of examples of how customers have used AIMSIM in their own aircraft designs. In this case, Leonardo Aircraft was optimizing their air conditioning architecture with SimCenter AIMSIM, looking at a very wide range of potential architectures to uh, maintain proper cabin comfort for the pilot. In this case, we're looking at uh, an electric aircraft engine. It was originally the Siemens E-Aircraft, which has since been acquired by Rolls-Royce. And as you can see, Amson was used here to assess the motor and battery cooling strategies, verify the electric powertrain coupled with the flight dynamics, and validate flight simulation with test data. Uh, you can see the quote from the client there, we could only develop such an enormous power density in this motor because we did it from the beginning based on the use of an integrated performance simulation suite, which includes AIMSEM. So what is included with AIMSEM is a wide variety of pre-built models and templates. That is uh, one of the huge strengths of AIMSEM versus um, building your own 1D models in MATLAB or in Modelica or some other tool is that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Lane is going to be showing us this very shortly, but there are pre-built components that you just drag and drop into your model, uh, assign your assumptions or your operating ranges to those models, and then you're ready to go. So you could include things like models for quadcopters, complete aircraft, ECS systems, etc. In all, there are about 90 templates included in SimCenter AIMSEM for uh, aerospace systems, flight controls, flight dynamics, fuel systems, uh, propulsion systems, et cetera, including all of the battery uh, power electronics and uh, battery cooling or thermal management systems required for fully electric aircraft. So at this point, I would like to turn things over to Lane, who is going to show us how AIMSIM is used and um, show us some models live. Okay. So the first thing I want to talk about before we get into this is exactly what the theoretical basis for Sim Center AIMSIM is. Um, if you're here, you probably have some idea of what systems modeling is. Uh, it's been used for decades, um, a lot of times, and it's, it's really used a lot in the academic community, um, but it's definitely being used more and more in industry. Uh, 
historically this is done by hand deriving the equations of motion and this can be all the way from using first principles like Kirchhoff's, Kirchhoff's laws, Newton's laws, making sure you have the right coupling, uh, all the way up to some more sophisticated approaches where some of you might have heard of something called Lagrange's equations or in the case of AIM-SIM, we use it's based on something called bond graph modeling. And this is an energy-based systems modeling approach. On the right, I've got this typical bond graph model development. At the top, this is just a basic uh, you know, mechanical layout that some of you might be familiar with. It's a quarter car model. Uh, this is actually used a lot in the automotive industry. But the thing that's different here is there's an active regenerative element on the left that's just a rack and pinion across a motor. Now on the right, as I go down in this workflow, that's what a bond graph looks like. Now there are courses at universities on how to do this, so it's not necessarily something that everybody learns. The cool thing is from the bond graph, we can actually get out the equations of motion, which are down at the, at the bottom. Once you get here, most pe this is where most people are probably familiar. You can take this, you can do linear systems analysis, you can do some control design, a bunch of different stuff. What AIMSIM does, it does the bottom for you. You basically have to just lay out your system using mm -hmm. various components, and then it will generate the equations of motion and then simulate for you. So there's a lot of work that can be done with this. Um, you can do systems architecture design studies. You can do trade studies. You can use these models to get bounds on specification definitions. You can do a lot of parameter studies. You can actually troubleshoot systems in that if you have something that you can't understand what's going on, you make a dynamic model and start sweeping parameters to figure out where, where is the problem. Um, you can do control design verification within AIMSIM, you can do some initial control tuning, and then you can always do model verification. Today we'll kind of stay within three, four, six, and seven. We won't actually do any control design that's already been done. Um, and we don't want to spend time just kind of tweaking, tweaking gains until everybody is really bored. So we're going to look at a distributed electric aircraft and we're gonna look at a developed simple model that'll take you, take everyone through how it was developed. Uh, we'll iterate with a couple parameters to look at ranges for different battery energy capacities. And then we'll also look at some of the rotor parameters to look at minimum requirements that you might see. Okay, so now I'm gonna jump over. Oh, no, that's right. We're gonna look at the model here first. So on the left, these are all the rotor dynamics. So you have four rotors and you have a motor that's driving a motor inertia that is then driving a propeller. I'll look at each one of these elements a little more in detail once we actually pop into AIMSIM. Down at the bottom, we have a pretty simple battery model. And on the right, we have the control system. Uh, this is a very simple control system, just basically it's set up to maintain some pitch, altitude, yaw, and roll. Uh, it's not really designed for full like missions such as where you're going to have a heading and need to control your lateral speeds and your longitudinal speeds. This is just a kind of a, an early, early verification control system. And then we have the flight dynamics. And while there is an airplane in here, this is not actually an airplane. This just is a generalization for any flight dynamics that include drag, lift, various things that you would see in, in flight dynamics models. Okay, at this point, pop this, and let's actually look at AIMSIM. So this should look very, very familiar. This is what we were just looking at. So if I were to build one of these things, um, all I would do is pop into sketch mode, go down to my electric motors and drives, find the motor that I'm interested in, which in our case was one of these guys, and just drag it in here. The reason the, the motor that I just dragged in looks different than the motor that is on the left in the system is this just means it's not fully connected. So at this point, instead of going through and actually finding all the elements they need to connect to this, I'm just gonna start copying and pasting certain things. So this is a temperature that you're setting the basically external temperature of the motor. 
um, grounding one side of the motor. So what this is saying is that it's not a, um, a an in, you're basically setting whether it's an in runner or an out runner. Um, we're gonna set another temperature on the electronics. And then I'm gonna grab an inertia and connect it to the right. Now you can see the inertia is, uh, is not connected. So it's showing that it's the, basically that the system is not complete. I'm gonna stop at this point because that's, we can just keep going. Then all of a sudden we hope we'll have rebuilt the entire system. But you can see that was really fast. And finding, having to go through and find all these elements is not really any slower uh, than copying and pasting when you get used to the libraries and well, where everything is. So within these sub models, we also have these little sensors. So uh, this one right here is a power sensor. Let's zoom in a little bit. This is a speed sensor, this is a position sensor. And then what happens is these are going back to a simple PID uh, controller that's trying to control the speed of the motor itself. Now, if you're interested in what's going on within each of these elements, all you have to do is pull open a help menu. And this is interesting. So this is, oh, that's right. Um, so this is basically the propeller model. Sorry, I thought I popped open the, the, wrong, um, the wrong one. But really, what this does is takes you through the development of every single aspect of this model, as Scott said. So I'm not gonna go into this in details, but everything is documented to this level, where you can go through, you can look at the usage, it'll, tell, it'll explain all of the variables, all the ins and outs. It will tell you the variable names within the model, uh, types, this is a little more advanced. It'll tell you the internal variables. Now this means things that you need to, uh, you need to set, uh, some parameters that need to be set all the way down to looking at this and it actually starts getting into down at the bottom. It's a ton of information. It'll get into the actual equations that are being used. We're gonna pop out of there. One of the other cool things about something like this, is if we go over, pop all the way over to simulation. It's compiling the system now off on my other screen. But if we look at this, and let's say you were really trying to quickly figure out what are, what are kind of the, the parameters that I need in this propeller. If I pick up this little, little icon right here, this will allow you to actually set the propeller geometry. And so you can do twist, chord, position, but if I change this, let's say I just pop that down and make it shorter, it'll auto change all of the, all of the propeller uh, coefficients, or sorry, the propeller geometry. What I then do is go into performance map generation, hit compute performance map, It'll say this GUI might not be responsive. It does actually take about 12 seconds. I'm going to hit no for now because we don't need to update this. But it will compute the, perform the new performance map. Then you hit send parameters and it will update all of the information in that propeller. So what we now have, if, if you went and did this on every single one, you now have different propeller geometry. You don't have to do CFD for you know, a week and a half, you can basically iterate in 12 and a half seconds. So once we get all those set up, then if we were to run the simulation and we don't need to do this because I've, I've pre-run it, it takes about 10 seconds, we get some cool stuff. We'll start popping up. So that's, that was the wrong, we got a different plot. So this is a very basic plot that's going to come out. Hang on. So this is just a simple one for this, this version of the model. Um, what I started to show is for the more complicated version. Uh, this is simply the tilt of one of the, one of the propellers and then the altitude. This is just some basic mission information. Uh, you can see that we're kind of holding, goes up and holds around 100, 
100 meters until about 80 or about 70 seconds and starts dropping down and landing. Now, one of the things is if you define the geometry as a parasolid and a lot of the stuff comes canned within AIMSIM, these backgrounds and stuff like that, you'll actually see this is what the simulation actually looks like. And this, this is running at 5x speed, um, but it's showing what the actual, what the outputs actually look like overall. Now, one of the things that I want to point out is I'm going to back this up just a little bit. Go back to right there. You notice this control system actually skidded out and that's something that if you were to have done this on your own and just written it in simulation or in like Simulink or something like that, if you don't have the visualization tools, you're just looking at charts. And I've looked at a lot of charts and simulation and vehicle dynamics and stuff like that. I probably wouldn't have caught that that skid turn happened. And if I was designing a really iterating on this controller to make sure that we're meeting, um, you know, uh, occupant comfort, for instance, you don't want to skid turn out because anybody who's ever been in a car or like go kart stuff like that, and you felt that it's a little disconcerting. So this gives you another opportunity to catch things like that, which you might not buy when you're doing this by hand. Now we're going to pop over into a slightly different. Um, now the this should look about the same. The main difference is in the control system, I've, I've messed with the pitch and altitude control so that we're not turning. This is purely a up, move forward a little bit, and then drop. Because as I promised, we're going to look at what happens when we have different battery efficiencies. One of the things that AIMSIM allows you to do is we can look at global parameters. So it allows a lot of these calculations of things like payloads and enter, you know, uh, maximum power generation of the motors, just whatever you actually need. So in our case, what I've set up in here is we have a base energy den density, which is high, but not out of, out of the range of possible for uh, certain lithium ion batteries. Um, but I've set the energy density of as 0.25 kilowatt hours per kilogram just as a base. Figure out a battery mass, which is going to be the total battery energy, which we've set at the top as 180 kilowatt hours. Divide that by the energy density. And this is going to end up being, I think it ends up being for this one, what is that? It's going to be about 720 kilograms. So then I've set a payload mass. And this is going to be the mass of the vehicle occupants whatever you want. I just set this as a thousand kilograms as a basis to kind of see see where we're at. And I'm thinking here, this is going to be the empty vehicle and probably one occupant to just see like, well, what happens when we start adding occupants? So that's all good. But what we also want to know is what happens when we change that energy density? What does that do to our total total flight time? So we can set up what we know as batch runs. We're actually going to run parameters and we end up with this batch set as opposed to a single run. And this is why I set up the new, um, the new model. So once you initiate as batch runs, what's going to happen is you're going to run over to study manager. And what I've set this up as is our nominal value for energy density, 0.25, like I had set before. And then I set a step, step size of 0.05. Then I set the number of steps below, number above. For those of you familiar with, you know, MATLAB and uh, NumPy, stuff like that, this is wind space. That's all this is doing is it's taking your parameters and it's setting wind space. Um, so once I do that, if I go back into simulation, if you look over here, you'll actually see now that it's done. If I went back and hit run, we're not going to do that so that we, um, it takes about 30 to 40 seconds to run all these. So I've, I've pre-run some of this so we can talk about what the outputs are. Um, it'll just run every single one of these. So for one parameter, this may not seem as powerful, but take into account that let's say you did three parameters with 10 different data points each, that's a thousand runs. And so 
this is going to run those thousand variables, and then you can pull all the data out and do your analysis however however you prefer. Um, but at 10 seconds per run, you can start to see how quickly this can be done. This is like a go to lunch and come back, and a lot of this stuff has been done, or maybe it's running in behind the scenes in the afternoon. But for us, this is what the outputs start to look like. You can see that the battery weight kind of affects the the total kilometers traveled. So we end up in, end up traveling at about 160 seconds. We end up going about between 10.5 and about 11.5 kilometers. Now, one of the interesting things that we saw here was the energy for this quad ends up being mainly used up by hover. Um, as I was kind of looking at the pitch that we wanted to get speeds and, and various things like that, I noticed that this, this ramp never really changed. It basically becomes, it decreases or goes negative a little bit, but overall, when we go from like traveling at a steady state speed of, let's say, 80 kilometers per hour to a steady state speed of 100 kilometers per hour, there's virtually no difference. So for this mass, and this payload, we, we end up dropping down to about 82.5%. So we drop 17.5% of our battery charge. So for some of these, what ends up happening, you, you need to keep about 40-ish percent of your battery in reserve. So basically, if you go to your site and say like, oh, I can't land there. I've got to go land somewhere else. You have to keep energy in, uh, in some, like in reserve for that. So for a payload of a thousand kilograms, let's assume it's one person. You know, we can start doing the math. You get about a two and a half x on that. So we could go somewhere between about twenty-eight and thirty kilometers with this with this setup. That's not bad. So let's see what happens when. And now you'll actually see the simulation. Go back to global parameters. Put this up to let's say we add four 100 kilogram passengers, or you know maybe it's you know, two adults and a and a child, or a larger adult, something like that. But let's put this up to 1400. Hit apply. We go back to run simulation. So this will take a minute, as I said. Um, while this is running in the background, you can. Watch, watch all the, the progress as it goes. Uh, just to point out some of the things in the future you could do with this. The, this battery model could get a whole lot more complex, um, being that you can add a lot of the electrochemistry and uh, thermal management that goes on. Uh, AIMSIM has a lot of this stuff pre-built and validated. Um, these motors could get turned into actual motor selections. When I mean actual motor selections, I'm talking about you know data sheets kind of thing, kind of things. You're adding specific motor inertias, you're adding uh, motor con torque constants, you're adding all that stuff. That's all easily available. Um, and again, you can sweep parameters. So if you're at the point where you're really trying to iterate on your design, then or you're working with a motor manufacturer and you need very specific resistances and, and torque constants, you can do that. Um, if you've got a pretty robust control system and you you know you validated this model, you can really look at what uh, you know what's what are my what are my best controls for the vehicle dynamics that I've set. Um, you can you know as your CFD engineers get more and more data, you can get you can build tables that feed into those propeller uh, the propeller models. Um, all these things are are possibilities. So it's really great in that you can get these abstract concepts that allow you to do a lot of um, a lot of really quick information, but it doesn't take a ton of time to iterate on a model once it's built. We update. So on this one, these are our new new outputs when we've added 400 kilograms. So you can see we went from minimum of like 82.5 percent state of charge down to about 77.5 so we're now at 
22.5, you're going to get at most of maybe 2.1x on your distance traveled. So we're not going to get much further than probably about 20, 22 to 25 kilometers at most. So this is this is good information. I mean, this is this is one of those things. If you're looking at like, okay, this is one of my maximum payloads, then now you're starting to look at, okay, maybe I need more battery. Ooh, if we can, you know, if 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 something happens in the battery industry in the next couple of years, or we're working with battery suppliers and they're like, yeah, we'll have, you know, we've got this new enabling technology coming out in the next year, you can add that in. And you're like, okay, this is what it does to our overall product. Um, so I think that's about it for this model for now. Um, other things, I guess one other thing that I want to point out is additional things that will affect overall energy usage. As Scott pointed out, there's a lot of work on comfort and you know air conditioning. This isn't in there, and that's gonna have to come from from you know from the battery. So this is a maximum, pretty much that we could have for this geometry. So. For now, I'm going to go back to what now. Um, and this is really like once it's built, it's kind of the world is your oyster. You can iterate the model. You can make it more complex. You can make just certain submodels more complex. You can use actual data to perform component selection, um, customize control algorithms, perform trade studies. I, it's, it's just there's a lot of different things you can do. Um, but once you start getting data, then it's pretty amazing how uh, how much these models, these simple 1D models, will actually meet performance and will be within a couple percent. I mean, you can I've seen models blind. I've built models that got within 10 to 15 percent of the actual, and we hadn't even iterated on any of the um, on any of the, the parameters. And once you get those parameters, it can easily turn into 5 percent error, 3 percent error. I mean, and you know, this is not what you want for really detailed things like CFD, but for full systems, that gives you, that makes it really, really powerful and you can get a much better handle on what the system can actually do. So I think at this point, I'm going to hand it back to Scott and Jonathan. Very good. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Lane. That was very, very interesting. And, and I can see that there's going to be, you know, even more uh, to see from this model as we continue to, uh, to add complexity to it. So Jonathan, uh, are you seeing any questions yet for us to address in the Q&A here? And for all participants, uh, Jonathan will uh, unmute you. So if you'd like to ask your questions aloud, um, feel free to do so or type them into either the Q&A or the chat window. Uh, we will catch both of those. Yeah, thanks, Scott. So um, again, definitely encourage everyone to submit those questions now. Um, I think if you'd like to unmute, um, just you know, put that in the chat too and I can, I can allow you to unmute. But we do have a couple questions. And so I'll go ahead and, and just kind of read some of those in, I guess. Um, maybe just kind of starting with you know, Lane, you had just mentioned that you can incorporate detailed performance data. How, how does that work? How do you get that into your AIMSIM model to improve accuracy? No problem. Well, okay, so there's there's a couple sides of that. Um, if you're going to have data, you know, this, this gets into um, starting to talk about system iteration, parameterization, possibly some system ID. Um, AIMSIM does actually support some online optimal uh, or optimization and parameter identification. So you will, you can feed data in and it will actually update the parameters for you and, and identify some of them. Um, one thing you can do, you know, there's always the, the brute force approach, which is if you've got the output, pull the, pull the output or the data in plot it against what you're seeing in AIMSIM and start tweaking variables until you get the same output. Now, danger with something like that and with a lot of the stuff is the more you have, I'd say more higher fidelity data, i.e. let's say, let's say, let's say this was a truly representative of, you know, this, this quadcopter that we've got here. Um, and we got some data out. What I would rather have is more like 
IO data of the motor and the propeller than like flight data if I was really going after the parameters here. Because you might say, you might, it, you know, one of your algorithms may kind of split the difference between like propeller performance and rotor inertia, say something like that. So you have to be a little careful and that's where, you know, that's where some of the working with Siemens and their applications engineers, people like ATA can really, uh, can really benefit you because we've done this. And, you know, we know a lot of the times um, that it's appropriate, sometimes it's not. And it, it's, unfortunately, we can get my engineering answer here, which is, it depends. Um, and there's, it's very subjective to the application. Okay, great. Um... And I guess that's kind of the the performance data side of things. How would we know, like like when would I want to move to a more sophisticated like three D FEA model CFD? How would I know when I wanted to to incorporate those instead of just you know the the, the different models that come in AIMSIM? Um, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm I'm really really kind of trying not to use the same it depends answer. Um, some of it is going to be, it is going to be application based, but let's say that you are in, in this case, it might be purely driven by getting something certified, right? So you're not going to be able to use like this 1D purely uh, on its own to issue any sort of like certification information for an aircraft or using it to validate an aircraft. Um, you're probably going to need to do some more CFD. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't use AIMSIM in that role, but that's one one situation where it's like you just have it dictated to you. Um, another situation is if you're really trying to eke out performance on like uh, system geometry or component geometry. So, for instance, the propellers are a perfect example. Um, it does a great job, but let's say this is truly a ducted, kind of a ducted fan like we saw where we have an outer, you know, an outer static ring um, and then that propeller is going through, you know, there you're going to have vortex shedding and all that stuff. And, and it's going to be somewhat uh, set by certain, you know, pitches and, and all kinds of various things like that. At that point, when you get further along in your development, that's when you really want to do it. And it's not necessarily that you need to, you know, incorporate. So, for instance, AIMSIM can co-SIM with Star CCM Plus. For those of you in the audience that are uh, familiar with it, it's not that you need to do a co-SIM every time, but you need to validate that AIMSIM is performing to the level that you need, or that the parameters are representative of the actual system within your simulation assumptions. Being like, okay, we're flying, you know, X speed. Uh, you know, we're flying at 120 kilometers an hour at, you know, I don't know 300 meters above sea level. Um, those are the points where it, it will naturally fit into your development. And when you're doing these more complex uh, systems like like air aircraft, it's going to be very obvious. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I'll keep running through the, the, the remaining questions we have. Again, welcome any additional questions. Uh, for any of our participants out there. Um, one, one new one that just came in, and I'll sort of skip ahead while we're on the topic of co-simulation. Um, can AIMSIM do co-simulation with, with Simpson or Nastran? That is what I've actually been working with them on. It can do co-sim with uh, NX Motion. And so it's it's a little little convoluted of a hook right now, but I've been in talks with with Siemens about this. So not currently. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, and sort of maybe a, a two part question on batteries. Um, kind of first part, can you model battery charge as well as dis discharge cycles, uh, battery temperature, and then um, if you wanted to model, you know, battery thermal management system and and the impact of that on battery capacity, charge discharge rates, cycle life, how, how would you model that? Let's start with the, uh, let's see, which is charge discharge rate. So back to sketch, literally you would start pulling, uh, take that temperature away, 
and you could go into the thermal thermal components wherever they are. Yeah, there we go, thermal. Um, and start using your thermal masses and, and building out your um, basically your resistances and masses here of the battery. And then you could go into it's going to be more uh, not liquid propulsion hydraulic. Let's say you had a hydraulic uh, hydraulic system. You could model all of that liquid cooling with basically these components. So again, it's it's basically just drag and drop. Um, it's it really it comes back to just building an engineering diagram. Now modeling the battery charge as well as discharge cycles. Um, the thermal management system is well. What I just talked about is going to model battery temperature, and so at that point you're going to be dealing with discharge cycles. Now one of the things with discharge cycles and looking at battery degradation is you can do some of that in here. Um, you're going to have to go back to the appropriateness of the model because that's over it can be over thousands of cycles as opposed to just one cycle so you'd have to think uh carefully sure. about that because again my for the unfortunate engineering answer <laughs> no no great answer appreciate it um and and maybe the last question here um unless any others come in um how does or or, or can aimsim handle and model fault conditions so like say you lose an engine or something like that can you can you model that and, and simulate what would happen in aimsim to a certain extent so the aimsim is not a control development package so it, it does some some good basic linear controls um and a little bit of non-linear as well this is where the power of cosim come comes in with something like uh simulink where aimsim is more is, is more uh or is better at simulating the whole system and the controls you might want to drop into MATLAB where you can do a lot more of the nonlinear work. And you're talking about with fault conditions, something like hybrid controls. And um, the closest you can get in AIMSIM with that is there's this little button here called create state chart. So it can actually do some state machine, state chart design for those of you that know what that is. But it is one of the way of dealing with fault conditions. So you can do it, um, but there are there are some other cosim ways that you can do it as well. Very good. And, and Scott, with that, I think I might turn things back over to you. Yes, I think we've uh, we've been through the questions so far. If something occurs to you after the webinar and you'd like to ask, uh, feel free to use any of the contact methods you can see on the screen. Uh, and. Uh, you will be receiving a follow-up email with the link to the recording of the webinar if you'd like to share it with any friends and colleagues who would be interested. Uh, with that, I would like to thank Dr. Lane Clemen for his presentation this afternoon, and thank you for joining us. And uh, we will let you know when the next part of this webinar series is available. Thank you very much.